on this computer. Okay. Hey, right, do you think we're good to start? Yeah, go for it. Okay. Okay, well, welcome everyone. Uh, my name's Gurpreet and I'll be uh, sort of acting as the moderator um, for this workshop and the workshop's titled Consensus on a Clinical Trajectory in Youth Substance Use Disorder Care and, and the Consequences. And it's by Jean and Mustafa. Um, so yeah, you guys can introduce yourselves. And uh, in terms of Q&A, you can ask your questions in the Zoom chat if you want. You can also use Whova. But since we're on Zoom itself, feel free to just ask it on Zoom. Yeah, and I'll hand it off to you, Jean. Yeah, awesome. Thanks, Capri. Uh, and I put that first slide up. Um, I was told to put it up for people if they want to follow um, the ACD Research Group um, on Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, or Twitter. Um, and there's the website here. Uh, so welcome, everybody, to our workshop. Um, so my name is uh, Jean Westenberg, um, and we are also joined by Dr. Mustafa Kamel um, from Egypt. Um, I'm in Switzerland right now, uh, and uh, I think I speak on behalf of both of us um, for, to thank everyone for being here um, and for uh, being present at our um, workshop. Uh, before we start, I just want to say that both Mustafa and I don't have any um, actual or potential conflicts of interest in relation to this presentation, and I'm going to let Mustafa introduce himself as well. Hello everyone, I am Mustafa Kamel. I'm a lecturer of psychology at Tanta University, Egypt, and uh, I am a researcher with addiction and concurrent disorder group with the Professor Kraus and Joe and all our team. Uh, my interest is in uh, youth mental health and e virtual solutions for youth as a substitute, as an integrative solution with the uh, current system. Um, I, I'll be uh, dealing with the Egyptian situation now as an example for was the trajectory transformation happening in the digital uh, field in Egypt? Uh, and uh, Jean, you can introduce yourself. Yeah, awesome. Um, I um, finished my master's um, at the University of British Columbia under the supervision of Dr. Michael Krauss. Um, and uh, I am a clinical research associate at the Center for Addiction Medicine in Stuttgart. And um, more recently, I have been working in Basel, Switzerland. And so my focus is particularly on addiction, concurrent disorders, and particularly among youth. Um, and so the objective of this workshop um, is to kind of um, go over the following. Um, so describe how the situation currently looks for youth in terms of overdose. Um, um, how can we rectify the system of care for youth? And what does the literature tell us? What do the experts in the field agree or disagree on? And how is the situation different or similar um, in Egypt? And so to answer those questions, the overview of the workshop will be in five parts. Um, so we'll give a quick introduction on high-risk substance use and overdose among youth. And then we'll talk about recent findings in a narrative review, looking at medication for opioid disorder among youth. Um, then go over a consensus process on international Delphi project and the consensus statements that were developed as a result. And then I'll pass over the mic to Mustafa, who will go over the situation in Egypt um, and discuss the national online mental health platform that is currently being developed um, under his supervision. Um, and so again, as Gupri mentioned, um, and I'll reiterate, if you have any questions, um, feel free to drop them in the chat um, and we'll get to them at the end of the presentation. And we hope to have a good discussion at the end as well of the workshop. Whoa. Um, okay, so I wanted to start by, uh, going over a case um, that demonstrates the dire need to reform our prevention and treatment approaches for high-risk substance use among youth. Um, this year is Alia Thomas, uh, her nickname is Ali. I mean, in, in uh, a year ago, in April, 2021, Ali died of an overdose at the age of 12 years old and became the youngest person to die of a suspected overdose in BC. Um, and so Ali's family had reported that she had overdosed already three times before this fatal one, and that they desperately sought help, but didn't find any because there's no appropriate treatment options in place for someone so young. Um, and so, yeah, where's my mouse? Yeah, there you go. Um, so I want to show this case to demonstrate um, an example, a really, really um, important example of 
what treatment um, and prevention approaches look like for youth and that there are really not that many available um, and what the consequences can be. Um, and so as I mentioned, uh, receiving any substance use care is in reality um, not really something that is done for youth. Um, and the study that Dr. Ignashevsky showed in her opening presentation, um, the study from uh, the United States with over 3,000 youth who had experienced an overdose, the vast majority of them uh, had received no addiction treatment. So almost 70% had received no treatment at all. Um, and only 2% received pharmacotherapy within 30 days of their overdose. Um, and so these results are really shocking given that the preferred treatment for adults is opiate agonist treatment um, and uh, medication for opiate use disorder. Um, and this is also shocking uh, given that studies broadly support the use of medication um, such as buprenorphine, methadone, and naltrexone among youth. Um, so this was the primary finding from a narrative review that we did. And this was published last year in early intervention psychiatry. Um, and from the 19 studies that we included in this narrative review, we found that studies mostly support the use of medication for opiate use disorder as they seem to be beneficial for youth and that pathways for opiate agonist treatment should be more readily offered in the pediatric primary care system uh, setting. And um, I want to go over uh, the medication options for youth from what we found in the literature, um, broadly speaking. Um, and so th that was uh, buprenorphine um, was the um, most uh, examined uh, medication for opiate use disorder. And that was um, you know, found to be effective among youth. Um, the same thing was true for methadone. Um, and some literature suggests that might have been more effective than buprenorphine among youth. Um, uh, but and reasons for that might be associated with methadone's relative to buprenorphine um, policy and pragmatic issues. Um, the clinical approach of each medication, so including dose range and dosing strategy. Um, so more research needs to be done on that, but both of those were um, deemed effective for youth. Extended release naltrexone uh, was promising um, and can be uh, a feasible third line treatment, but uh, a lot more studies are required before confidently adding it to the range of medication for use disorder. Uh, then there are also a lot of studies that looked at adjunct treatment, so medication used alongside buprenorphine and methadone. Um, and so there were antidepressants in methadone programs that were not significantly associated with reduction in relapse risk. And then memetamine, um, which did not significantly improve retention um, in the short-term treatment with buprenorphine. So varying effectiveness on those and, and more research really needed. But I think that the biggest uh, take home from our narrative review was that um, medication will be sort of work among youth. Uh, and more importantly, there needs to be a lot more research um, to explore how combining short-term symptomatic medications with buprenorphine or methadone may be more effective um, and what kind of medication that are used in adults can also be used in youth. Um, yeah. And so regardless of um, medication for opiate use disorder being provided to youth, we're still seeing an alarming number of overdose deaths among youth in BC um, more than ever before. So I'm sure that um, a lot of us have seen this table before in the coroner's report, but I want to put these numbers up here um, to, to, to see again. Um, so in 2021, 29 individuals below the age of 19 and 325 individuals before, below the, between the ages of 19 and 29 died of um, drug overdose in 2021. And this is higher than any other year on record. So the increasing potent drug markets, as well as the lasting impacts of the pandemic on mental health uh, should be a concern really to all those providing care to youth. And the question becomes, you know, what, what can we do for these youth? Um, uh, which brings us to uh, with, which brings us to Plastic Park. Um, so Plastic Park was the epicenter of the um, European open drug scenes in um, Zurich in the nineties in the in the early nineties. Um, and it was actually nicknamed Needle Park. Um, and so the the Swiss successful response to the open drug scenes. Um, was a shift from a repressive attitude against drug using youth to an active policy of supportive measures to prevent health and social deterioration. And so what was key to this paradigm shift in Swiss drug policy was the mapping out of scientific consensus and controversies to improve the center of care provided to those with high-risk substance use. 
So, you know, along those same lines, we wanted to do something similar. So we recently conducted a Delphi study in which we brought together a group of 31 experts in the field of youth substance use disorder from 10 different countries in order to establish a consensus for the prevention, treatment, and management of high-risk substance use among youth. And so this was accepted for publication and really, really, really hope that this is published soon so that we can um, share these statements with um, everyone. Uh, and what resulted from this consensus group um, was a total of 60 statements that are internationally recognized consensus statements that can be used by all those involved in the care and support of youth with high risk substance use and therefore act as a first step in system improvement and reform. I obviously won't go over all 60 statements here in this short presentation, but I do want to go over the methods and the main takeaways from the consensus process, especially as it relates to prevention and treatment. Uh, just to quickly go over the, the methods and how we did this. Um, so we used a multidisciplinary international group of 31 experts um, who were invited to participate in this consensus process. And invitees were identified distinguished clinicians and researchers um, who were able to provide insight from their in-depth direct experience in working with um, adolescents. And so the panelists were from 10 different countries, um, as we can see here in the table. Um, I think that we can all guess who the um, Egyptian panelist was, uh, Mustafa Kafkaf. Um, and, uh, and they're also from uh, mostly from a psychiatric uh, background, uh, mostly specializing in child and adolescent psychiatry and addiction psychiatry. But we also had some GPs, some emergency medicine specialists, um, psychologists, and pediatricians. So what does the Delphi process look like? What did we really do um, with these experts? Uh, we first sent them a semi-structured questionnaire. So this is a questionnaire with open-ended questions, asking them to provide um, their feedback on some of the questions that we had, which was based on the narrative review that we'd done earlier. And so they were able to answer those questionnaires. From their answers, from the 31 experts, we created initial statements from their answers. And then we sent them the statements back. And we said, please rate these on a scale from uh, one to five, from strongly agree to strongly disagree. And so essentially what we did with the answers was that um, the statements that had over 95% agreement among the experts were um, put to one side and those were considered consensus statements. And then those that didn't reach this, uh, consensus, so those in which there was some disagreement among the experts, um, we asked the experts to um, provide a different phrasing or how would they uh, phrase or structure the consent, the statement so that they would agree with the statements. And so from the feedback, we were able to revise the statements and send it out for a second round. And then this happened another time where we basically went over what was disagreement and what was agreement. And then we um, asked them to revise them to give us consensus or um, not. So from those uh, three rounds of rating, we basically ended up with that list of 60 consensus statements that I mentioned that were based on um, their expert feedback. And so I'll go over uh, basically the main takeaways as I see it um, in terms of prevention and treatment. Um, and then after that, I'll, I'll pass the mic over to Mustafa and then we can talk about what is happening in Egypt. Um, in terms of prevention, um, it's obviously a critical component to reducing the burden of disease for high-risk substance use among youth. Um, and in terms of prevention, uh, the experts agreed that web-based technologies can really play a massive role. Um, like the near ubiquity of cell phone coverage, the time spent online, the dominating internet communication patterns among youth have really defined a new lifestyle change. Um, and so this provides a significant new opportunity to build the capacity required to um, do appropriate outreach and engagement with youth um, where they live and where they learn. And so online interventions can also be developmentally and culturally appropriate. Um, but with that being said, right, um, the healthcare system must also address the digital determinants of health and the unequal access to digital health services among youth. So that's not to say that in-person services are not important. Um, they're really critical, but they must also be made low threshold, youth friendly and stigma free um, so that they're interesting and especially safe for youth to use. In terms of uh, treatment, um, the objective, uh, so the experts agreed um, that the objective in treating youth with high substance use must be to reduce harm and mortality 
to prevent interference in adolescent development and substance-related impairment, and to promote resilience and positive youth development. And so to that point, all evidence-based interventions should be made available and used according to the needs and preferences of youth. And so this includes, for instance, opiate agonist treatment for opiate use disorder among youth. And then something to also remember, um, which is what the experts um, really place emphasis on is that family is a major resource um, when dealing with youth, um, as opposed to when dealing with adults. Um, family is a major resource that can be involved in the youth treatment process. But importantly, parental or family involvement can also be very complicated and should not be a barrier to youth receiving care. To conclude um, this first section of the workshop, um, I want to kind of summarize that there is a lack of research, of evidence, of resources, and of training um, in this domain. Uh, developing consensus is necessary because it creates a framework, um, but there also needs to be a massive implementation of evidence-based, culturally appropriate, youth-specific solutions. And I hope that by um, discussing the situation in Egypt, we can see how the implementation of an evidence-based youth specific solution um, is actually being carried out in reality. Um, and so I think that without change, um, especially in Canada and the US, um, the rising fatalities, especially through overdose are really unavoidable. Um, and I think it's really important that youth and their support systems uh, have a seat at the table and are um, key, key to uh, developing these um, systems that are for them. Uh, so with that, I'll pass it over to uh, Mustafa. Uh, yeah. So please let me share my screen. Go for it. Hello everyone. Let me introduce myself again in short for people, those who are uh, just attending. I am Mustafa Kamel. I'm a psychiatrist and a lecturer of psychiatry at Faculty of Medicine, Tanta University. And I have just finished my PhD uh, with the Professor Krause at the field of e-mental health for youth. And let me take you to another aspect of dealing with youth. We are going to speak about the implementation of e-mental health solution to, uh, in Egypt. I'll just start by giving short notes about what the current situation in Egypt. Good thing that this photo is just three weeks ago and Egypt really is missing uh, Dr. Western Per. In Egypt, as uh, most, uh, this age spectrum, adolescents and teens are under stress, not only for their grades situation, the add-on with the COVID stu uh, situation restrictions, put a lot of stress on the uh, in youth and students in Egypt. According to WHO, we have about 20 to 30 Egyptian adolescents with diagnosed with mental illness, uh, depression, and anxiety are the most common diagnoses. This figure increased up to 37% and up to 65% among medical students because of the uh, burden of stress of, of their studies. For substance use, around 22% of universities are using substance. Cannabis is the most common substance in Asia, and tramadol is the most common pharmaceutical drug. And tomorrow we have to be interesting uh, workshop for the tramadol crisis uh, in Africa. About 60% of substance users are poly substance, and the age spectrum for the onset was about from 15 to 19. For suicide, yeah, despite that globally, suicide contribute about 6% of all this among uh, youth and the situation increased among the COVID-19, our reports for suicide are very uh, restricted and under reports of the state. For the service provider, we have on, only about 0.7 psychiatrists for every 100,000 population and 0.2 psychologists for every 100,000 population. This is not only the problem, but also there's a disproportionate distribution between urban and rural areas. All psychiatrists and psychologists, most of them are 
uh, concentrated in uh, urban areas. The situation is catastrophic, more for youth, with only about 3% of the staff working on child and adolescent mental health services. We have another barrier of seeking help, which is stigma. Stigma is deeply ingrained in the familiar and social cultural fabric of the Arabic society. It affects youth mental health, help seeking behavior. Females have higher public and self stigma against mental illness and addiction. And as I mentioned, the official number of suicide is very low. There is a lot of under report for suicide because of the stigma of suicide in Egypt and our uh, society. So, on my PhD with Professor Kraus, we thought about two uh, new solutions and innovative solutions, and we decided that it's a, it's a time now for a paradigm shift towards e-mental health. So, what our requirements start? We set our priorities for Egypt. We started by thinking about to put a strategic framework for e-mental health. Think about starting for national e-mental health platform, national telehealth center, and virtual clinic program. This will be with international collaboration and partnership with University of British Columbia presented in Professor Kraus with International Advisory Board. They helped us to set the strategy for e-mental health and we used the Canadian Walk Along and uh, Risk Assessment and Management Platform as our role models. The good thing is that, uh, fortunately, we just scored our goal with launching our uh, uh, national mental health platform two weeks ago. It's uh, introducing this or providing this functionality, the triage and the crisis response we have like immediate uh, transformation to the hotline if you have a suicide or overdose, providing all self-assessment uh, tools and screening, allow the patient or the client to set his goals and go through stepped care models and to refer to the current system. And the good thing is that we now have uh, electronic medical records and data allow us to uh, go for feedback and improving our service. To be integration through the current system of care and the school system, and we are working to that with the academic institutions. The other project is we are working on now the first virtual clinic for student mental health. We call it a safe student because of the stigma. So a lot of students who is are suffering from mental health problems, not seeking help because of the stigma. So now we are providing the virtual clinic program for them. We are using Tanta University as a pilot study. Uh, it will allow them for better access to high quality. The good thing that we are going to engage uh, students in all stages, even from the designing of the service. This is collaboration between the Ministry of Higher Education and Scientific Research in Egypt, the University of British Columbia in Canada, the General Secretary of Mental Health and Addiction as a representative of Ministry of Health in Egypt, and it's already funded by the World Health Organization. This is the system of the future and the future of our system, as Professor Kraus mentioned, be like integration between all that. Current system is face-to-face face -face, uh, service, the virtual clinic one, and the web platform will give the client the sustainability of care and uh, better accessibility. We are seeing that there is a brighter future for Egyptian youth by the help of that Professor Kraus, and as Raj Benjavi's American uh, physician mentioned before that, no one should die because he lives away from a doctor. The same concept that we are working on with Professor Kraus, no one should suffer because he lives away from a psychiatrist. So we are going to introduce this service and provide them to all unreached population in Egypt. And thank you. It's time to question now yep um yeah okay uh yeah there seems to be a few questions in the zoom chat um but yeah like if anybody wants to unmute their mic and talk you're more than free to do that but um it seems like sue ward has a question um early on and it says models of family intervention that are well supported for families where youth have oud evidence and practice 
Sue, if you want to unmute yourself, you can, or you can elaborate in the Zoom chat if you want to. What was your question? I think I'm was... wondering what the current state of the evidence is around family therapy interventions where youth have an opioid use disorder. What do we know about that, and what's the consensus around that? Yeah, I can 